Hello, and welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America's live webinar, What You Need to Know About COVID-19 and MS, Program 6. I am Peter Demiri, Vice President of Programs and Services for MSAA, and your host for tonight's program. On behalf of MSAA and our presenters, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to keep you updated on this very important topic. And please know, we hope you and your family are staying safe and keeping healthy in these uncertain times. MSAA is extremely honored to welcome back our two MS expert advisors who will update us about the coronavirus pandemic and its impact on MS and answer your questions during our expanded Q&A session. At this time, I would like to introduce our special guest presenters, Dr. Barry Hendon and Dr. Carrie Hirsch. Dr. Barry Hendon is MSAA's Chief Medical Officer and a practicing neurologist at Phoenix Neurological Associates. He's also the director of the Multiple Sclerosis Clinic at Banner University Medical Center and clinical professor of neurology at the University of Arizona Medical School. Dr. Carrie Hirsch is the chair of MSAA's Healthcare Advisory Council. She is a practicing neurologist and assistant professor of neurology for the Cleveland Clinic Lou Rivo Center for Brain Health in Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you both again so much for being here tonight and keeping us updated on this very important topic. Peter, we are delighted to, uh, to join you again. I speak for Dr. Hirsch and myself uh, in saying that uh, uh, we're pleased to be able to present again uh, with the evolving information on COVID-19. Great, thank you, Dr. Hendon. Well, before we begin, I wanna take this opportunity to thank our supporters, Bristol Myers Squibb, EMD Serono, Genentech, Novartis, and Sanofi Genzyme for making this webinar series possible. As you may know, MSAA is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to improving lives today for the MS community. In fact, this year marks MSAA's 50th anniversary as an MS advocacy organization. Listed here are just some of the many free programs available to people living with MS all across the country, along with our new COVID-19 and MS Pathfinder tool, which now provides ongoing updates and resources on the coronavirus. Also, please know MSAA has expanded our helpline hours to 8 p.m. Eastern between Mondays and Thursdays. To learn more about our services, please visit mymsaa.org or give us a call at 1-800-532-7667. And lastly, tonight's program will be archived on our website very soon. During the program, please type your questions into the chat box on the screen, and we'll present them at the end for our Q&A session. Also, if you are having any technical issues, please type those concerns into the chat box as well. So with all of that now covered, I am very honored to once again introduce Dr. Barry Hendon, who will kick off tonight's program. Thank you again, Peter. I, uh, uh, the, the first two slides uh, appeal to me because of, of the humility uh, uh, attached uh, to the slide. Uh, the first slide is what we know about coronavirus. The second slide that I'll be presenting is what we don't uh, know with any level of certainty about the coronavirus. And that, that's important for everybody to keep in mind. There are things we know, some basic things that we really do know by now. But we're only uh, eight months into this pandemic, uh, eight months experience with this uh, novel uh, and, and mutating uh, coronavirus that causes COVID-19. And so although there may be people who tell you things definitively, uh, I think Dr. Hirsch and I believe that there is a lot that we would have you understand uh, is still uh, formative. We're still learning. Uh, and a lot of our answers are still in the phase of, of uh, what we know now, uh, what we are learning more about, uh, and, and, and what we still don't know sufficiently well. So let me start with what we do know about the coronavirus. Um, this, this is really basic. Uh, this is COVID-19-101. So uh, we know that this is a, a novel coronavirus that causes the disease, the disease being COVID-19. Uh, and that the target for this disease is the respiratory system. But we also know that, that this is not um, 
so selective that other parts of the body are not affected. We know that heart can be affected, the renal function can be affected. And there are other neurologic complications. So people who have contracted COVID-19 have also experienced other neurologic complications, such as strokes or seizures or uh, injury to the spinal cord or uh, injury to the peripheral nerve uh, or alteration in sense of smell and taste. Uh, so although we think of it as a uh, respiratory target, uh, it is not exclusively respiratory and there are neurologic complications. What we Dr. do Hennig, know is uh, that they... Yeah. Dr. Hendon, I'm sorry, this is Peter. I was just interrupting, but actually I think the audio sounds better. It was a little muffled earlier, so I, it, it might have sounded better just as um, you were coming back on. So um, I don't know if you were a little further away or not, but um, I, why don't you give it a try again? I'll do it once again. So, uh, oh, that, no, what that's I began, perfect. That's perfect. Great. Thank <laughs> you. So, what I started saying was that that uh, the, the two slides that I'll be doing um, really represent an exercise in in humility, and that is what we know and what we don't know, uh, because it's still early experience. We're still uh, eight months into this uh, pandemic, and we're still learning. So, what do we know about the coronavirus? We know that it is primarily uh, has a, a respiratory system target, but that doesn't mean that other parts of our body can't be affected, heart uh, and uh, kidney, uh, for example, and that there can't be other neurologic complications uh, besides those that people with MS worry about. So uh, in people with uh, COVID-19 who don't have MS, we've seen strokes and seizures and spinal cord injury and peripheral nerve injury and alteration in smell and taste. Um, we also know uh, that there are some basics that people should uh, be relying on in order to reduce risk. Things like wearing masks. Um, when you're in a situation where you're among others, wear that mask. It's not clear how much we are protected by the mask we wear, but it is clear that we reduce the risk to others. But also, hand washing, social distancing, avoiding crowds, uh, and then what um, we would call prehabilitation, not rehabilitation, but prehabilitation, that is maintaining the best possible health by maintaining best diet, um, uh, maintaining your weight at a, at a proper level, uh, exercising, if you smoke, stopping smoking. In other words, it's a perfect time to pay attention to the other aspects of health that are so important in outcomes uh, for, for COVID-19. Um, some people do well, some people don't do quite so well. Uh, it's clear that the healthiest people um, uh, have a better outcome than those who have a lot of other medical problems, especially if they're not controlled. Uh, we know that MS does not necessarily put you at greater risk for COVID-19. That's an optimistic uh, uh, and favorable understanding. But um, if you've got MS, uh, you are subject to all the other things that everybody else has. Um, so if you have MS and have, uh, are older than age 55, 65, um, age in and of itself creates this uh, risk. We talked before comorbidities, heart disease, lung disease, uncontrolled diabetes, smoking, obesity, all of those create greater risk. And so if you have MS, it's not the MS that's going to put you at greater risk. It really is more than anything else, uh, age and comorbidity. So uh, the question would be, do my disease-modifying therapies create increased risk and therefore should I stop them? Um, it is generally the consensus in the treating community that you should not stop or change your disease-modifying therapy uh, without a clear discussion uh, with your uh, clinician, with your treating uh, clinician. Uh, uh, in fact, stopping some of the disease-modifying therapy increases the risk of a relapse uh, and worsening disease activity. So by and large, unless there's another reason to stop or change the disease-modifying therapy, uh, we recommend that you stay with the agent that's been prescribed in helping you. But certainly don't change or stop without discussing it with your clinician then what don't we know? So that's what we know. What don't we know? 
um, we, we really are too early uh, with insufficient numbers to be able to, to say that one particular disease modifying therapy is uh, the best or worst uh, in the era of COVID-19. Uh, this is something that we're clearly exploring. In the early days uh, of uh, COVID-19, the, some of the European countries uh, uh, thought that there may be a differentiation uh, between one, uh, one group of uh, agents and another. I think in, in the U.S. we're exploring that and saying that as of the moment, we do not have sufficient evidence uh, to uh, say that one particular agent uh, should be uh, avoided or preferentially treated or used. We're also trying to, everybody's interested in, in um, what vaccines uh, will be moving forward. And uh, it's premature to say uh, a lot of things about the vaccine. How long will the immunity last? Will the immunity be complete? Will the degree of immunity be different in younger people versus older people? We do think on a hypothetical basis that there are some agents which will mute the immune response and others which will probably leave the immune response uh, relatively unmuted or uh, full, fully vigorous. But these are things still to be worked out. Um, it's still to be worked out whether this is a live virus or, as I suspect, uh, a, non, um, a, non, a, a live vaccine or a non-live vaccine, and I, I suspect it will be the latter. Uh, but uh, all of this is still to be worked out, and that is, uh, will there be immunity? Uh, how profound will that immunity be? And how long will it last? Um, we can't say without the, without the vaccine. And then um, if you have antibodies, can you be um, reinfected? It depends on how long the antibodies last and how high the antibody level is. It's like any other uh, uh, viral infection. So it appears, uh, at least by common sense, that people who have been infected uh, will have some degree of immunity for some period of time. Um, but again, how much for how long, you still are watching. And then um, once you recover, have you fully recovered? I think there is a, an exploration right now about the fact that some people seem to toss it off uh, fairly easily. Uh, some people are, uh, don't have any symptoms, despite the fact that they've gotten the virus. Other people have profound illnesses and deaths. Uh, but even those people who recover often recover uh, with some degree of, of, uh, of lasting symptomatology, at least over a period of weeks and months. Uh, this is something, again, seven months in, eight months in, we're still exploring. So with that discussion of the knowns and unknowns, before we get to questions and answers, I'd like to turn uh, this over to Dr. Hirsch uh, for her thoughts uh, about uh, what we can do uh, for, for our maintenance of the wellness and best health uh, with COVID-19. Thank you much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hendon. Um, that was a very succinct and uh, comprehensive overview of some of the attributes of COVID-19 we do understand um, as it pertains to the general population and, of course, more specifically to the MS population. But uh, I agree that um, this, um, this, this COVID-19 uh, pandemic has uh, humbled uh, not only me, but other members of the healthcare community uh, in terms of how much we really don't know yet um, about this virus and how it impacts people who carry other chronic uh, autoimmune conditions and other chronic comorbidities uh, that Dr. Hendon had, had discussed. Uh, we are still learning uh, a lot about this virus every day. And fortunately, there is a lot of work being done um, in the scientific community by the best and brightest and the MS scientific community to try to collate better information on what is the COVID-19, what is the risk to folks who live with MS and who are on certain disease-modifying therapies. And fortunately, over the past six to eight months, we have been able to learn quite a bit. But as Dr. Hendon had alluded to, um, this, this really has humbled us in the um, MS scientific field in terms of how much we still have yet to learn. So um, I, I would say that a lot of this information, uh, we will continue to learn along the way. And of course, we are happy to keep the MS community uh, informed and involved as much as possible. 
So um, let me just go back in. I, I want to review, well, what can we do in the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic in order to try to prevent or thwart uh, some of the risk factors that are involved in increasing one's susceptibility or one's risk of either developing the COVID-19 infection or having a worse time of it. And some of the things uh, Dr. Hendon had already alluded to. So some are what we call non-modifiable risk factors, and that does include one's age. So we've been able to see that folks typically over the age of 60 years, uh, they might have an overall inherently increased risk of developing uh, COVID-19. Uh, folks who are uh, physically disabled may also have an inherently increased risk of becoming susceptible to COVID-19. But there also are a number of what we call modifiable risk factors that one may be able to work on either themselves or with the help of their MS uh, healthcare provider or their primary care provider uh, to decrease that overall risk. And some of those things um, are reducing the uh, severity or the risk of having certain vascular comorbidities. So those include uncontrolled high blood pressure. That includes uncontrolled diabetes. That includes uncontrolled cardiovascular disease. And tobacco smoking, vaping, and chewing. And we have been able to learn, even in the short span of six months, that these risk factors, um, if they go um, uncontrolled, it does increase the risk of developing a viral infection. So I would encourage those who are participating in today's event that if you do carry a diagnosis of MS and have some of these other modifiable risk factors, that you may want to have a conversation with your primary care doctor and your MS healthcare team about ways that you might be able to reduce some of those risks. Um, this is a really good time to pay attention to your blood pressures, um, your sugar readings if you have a history of diabetes, and to make sure that you are um, abiding by uh, other recommendations such as uh, tobacco cessation or trying to work on a program that um, will reduce the amount of tobacco that you are currently taking in. So some other things that you can do that may not um, uh, require the need of a doctor's visit, because I know that there are some concerns about the safety of going to the doctor's office, and we'll actually be addressing that in uh, a subsequent question. But some things that you can just do day to day, getting plenty of sleep, being physically active, um, you know, right now it might be uh, difficult to do some of the things that we previously enjoyed, uh, maybe playing a sport that, you know, required um, a lot of people or close-to-close -close interactions or going to a gym. But there are other things that you can do either in your home or outside if you're actually living uh, in a location uh, where being outside is just not overly hot or overly cold. Um, and then there are a lot of uh, YouTube videos and virtual exercise classes uh, that folks can go ahead and participate in uh, that will help increase your level of physical activity on a day-to-day -day basis that not only we have been able to show um, has long-term benefits in folks who are living with MS purely based on MS disability, but also reducing uh, the risks and consequences of some of these other vascular comorbidities. Managing stress uh, to the best of your ability um, is also another way that we can uh, remain emotionally well. Um, you know, right now this is a very uh, stressful and emotionally charged environment that we are all living in, and we could all use help when it comes to managing stress. So whether or not that's something that you have been able to self-identify as stress management um, exercises, some of those things might be taking up a hobby or um, doing things that give you a sense of inner peace, like reading or listening to soft music, um, other things like yoga 
or Tai Chi. There are some virtual yoga programs. We actually have one at the Cleveland Clinic that folks have found to be very helpful. And then when folks need a little bit of help, maybe um, discussing options either with a local counselor or your MS healthcare provider team. There are certainly online resources that are provided by um, uh, uh, MS foundations. Um, so if you ever have any questions uh, regarding what are ways that you can manage stress, um, getting your uh, MS healthcare provider in the loop um, is a good idea so that way they can discuss options with you. Drinking plenty of fluids, especially now during the hot summer months, um, Dr. Hendon and I both practice um, in the desert, in the Sun Belt. Uh, temperatures are very high right now. We're talking about 110 degrees plus. So making sure that you are trying to keep cool, not being outside during peak um, um, uh, heat temperatures, drinking lots of fluids throughout the day, all of this is very important. And of course, eating nutritious foods. Uh, we usually recommend a nice anti-inflammatory nutritional regimen, uh, the Mediterranean uh, nutritional regimen that tends to encourage lean proteins, um, whole foods like uh, colorful fruits and vegetables, um, um, multi-grains instead of white breads and, and white rice, and of course, high fiber and plenty of fluids is usually the best way to go um, as far as we understand uh, when it comes to um, MS and COVID-19. Uh, taking a walk outside while abiding by social distancing recommendations is a great way to get fresh air and exercise. Um, I will admit that when we put together these slides, we were still uh, uh, during uh, the springtime uh, when uh, uh, most locations, uh, you know, you would be able to go outside fairly comfortably. Now where in certain locations it's very hot, it's very humid, um, you know, Opportune times to go outside would probably either be early in the morning or later in the day after the sun goes down to try to avoid um, high temperatures and overheating because we understand that um, um, increased heat and over uh, exertion during high peak temperature hours can sometimes lead to transient worsening of MS symptoms, which of course we would like to try to avoid. Um, staying connected. So social distancing does not equal social disengagement. And um, I, I actually don't like the concept social distancing. I think physical distancing is probably a better way to describe um, what the CDC is actually asking for all folks to be doing in keeping at least six feet away from another person to try to decrease the exposure uh, to respiratory droplets in another um, human being. Uh, but, you know, this does not mean that we, we can't still be connected. And, you know, even though we would all like to be able to see our, our friends and our family face to face, um, there are other uh, means for remaining connected with our loved ones. Um, that can either be through telephone, that could be through FaceTime, that can be through Zoom chat meetings. And again, they're not ideal, but um, we do have other methods that we can try to encourage, at least until the time where we feel that the COVID-19 pandemic risks have decreased uh, nationwide. And mental health is extremely important. Um, you know, in, historically, uh, mental health, depression, and anxiety have been stigmatized and this really should not be the case. It is so important, especially during COVID-19. And I urge and encourage everyone on this line that if you are struggling, please reach out to a trusted friend, a family member, or your healthcare provider, because there are certain programs, methods, and folks out there who are more than happy to help during these challenging times. So, um, Carrie, shall we we uh, go through the questions that have already been submitted to us? 
Um, I think that we um, can go back to the uh, regular question, yeah, the popular questions from registration, right. and then we can go to the uh, uh, the questions that have been that have been posed by this particular group. Great. So Dr. Hirsch and I will uh, have a uh, at least answer some of the questions that have been pre-submitted, uh, and uh, the first is. Since seniors are more severely impacted if they contract or contract uh, COVID-19 virus, are people with primary progressive MS more vulnerable and is mortality higher for them than for seniors with other forms of MS? It's actually a very um, um, thoughtful question which is being asked. <clears throat> Let's begin with, the, with what we told you to start with and then, and then we'll try to answer that on a logical basis and what the evolving information says. So, we know that, the, as Dr. Hirsch uh, also uh, commented, the older you are, the more likely you are to have uh, a poor outcome uh, with COVID-19. And by poor outcome, I mean hospitalization, intubation, and, and death. And the higher your level of disability, uh, uh, the greater the risks are to you if you do get COVID-19. So it stands to reason uh, that if there was a group that was older um, or more severely impacted, they would uh, have greater risks. People with primary progressive MS are on average older than the people um, uh, who uh, start out with relapsing MS. Uh, and as such, people um, with uh, later MS, either primary progressive or secondary progressive, um, will just by the by the uh, dint of their age be at greater risk for uh, bad outcomes, including mortality. Add to that at least the emerging data. Uh, as some of you know, there is a uh, collection of the American data uh, now with more than 800 cases through uh, what's called COVID-MS, C-O-V-I-M-S, uh, out of Washington University under the auspices of Dr. Ann Cross. She's collected 800 uh, or over 800 uh, uh, people with MS who've had uh, COVID-19, and we're beginning to at least see some of the patterns. The older you are, including later secondary progressive or primary progressive MS, the greater your risks. The more disabled you are, uh, the greater your risks, which is to say people who are walking freely have less risk than people who are using walkers and they have less risk than people who are in wheelchair, uh, and they presumably have re less risk than people who are bedbound. So the answer to your question is, yes, statistically, primary progressive MS uh, carries a greater vulnerability and mortality. Um, but it's not because of the diagnosis, it's because of the age uh, and greater disability often associated with both primary and secondary progressive MS. A very thoughtful question. Uh, Dr. Hirsch. Okay. The second question, um, actually, Dr. Hendon has started to allude to. Uh, so the question is, I was wondering if you collected any data on the number of people that have MS who have contracted COVID-19. How do they seem to do? And is it any worse than a person without MS? So as Dr. Hendon has been alluding to, over the past um, six months or so, um, MS researchers have done um, a lot of work in trying to collate um, data in a standardized fashion across many different institutions in different countries. And there are um, a couple of uh, pretty large um, MS and COVID-19 databases. One is actually uh, was developed in Italy and it's currently uh, ongoing and collecting uh, patient data. And the other is the uh, COVID-MS effort, which is a collaborative effort uh, between um, uh, the National MS Society, the MS Society of Canada that is being spearheaded by Dr. Ann Cross and Dr. Amber Salter. And um, in, the, in the latter uh, database, the COVID-MS database, which is actually made available uh, uh, publicly on their website, over 800 patients 
um, with confirmed MS have actually voluntarily uh, been uh, uh, uploaded into this database uh, by clinicians. And overall, over 85 to 90 percent of those patients have actually been described as either recovered from their COVID-19 infection or are actually in the process of recovering. And there is um, um, a large um, uh, heterogeneity between um, uh, different disease courses or MS phenotypes, whether or not they're relapsing, remitting, primary progressive or secondary progressive, but it looks like overall um, the majority of patients who are having a more difficult time with COVID-19 are the ones who have those other comorbidities, those other risk factors that we have briefly talked about. So patients who are over the age of 60 or 65 years, those who have um, cardiovascular disease, um, uncontrolled diabetes, high blood pressure, morbid obesity, or who are chronic smokers. And we found that um, of the patients who did not do well, over 85% of them had at least one comorbidity uh, listed. Um, in terms of disease-modifying therapies, and I know that that is um, a very hot and popular question um, uh, among folks who are living with MS, but also healthcare providers as well, uh, because the more information we have, the more we'll be able to help stratify risk and um, determine best treatment practices in, in the clinic. And overall, um, um, uh, all disease-modifying therapies that have been listed, um, for the most part, at least one patient um, has been um, determined to have been uh, exposed to COVID-19. There doesn't seem to be a, a significant relationship to any disease-modifying therapy in particular, except for maybe some of the um, uh, uh, immunosuppressive agents where we might have to be uh, a little bit more careful, scrutinize the individuals who are undergoing treatment. And, and I will say that these data are not um, completely sparsed out in terms of every individual on a certain disease-modifying therapy, what do they look like? What other comorbidities do they have? So there might actually be um, uh, an unequal or disproportionate uh, percentage of patients who are treated with certain immunosuppressive therapies or certain Im immunomodulator therapies that have other comorbidities that actually increase that risk of COVID-19 even further. So this, is, this data is really not to dissuade people from being on disease-modifying therapies. In fact, it's felt to reassure um, the recommendations that we have been um, recommending even from the very beginning in terms of not stopping disease-modifying therapies um, unless otherwise specified by the healthcare provider. Um, very similar data were actually reported by the Italian group uh, who actually uh, uh, published their findings in Lancet Neurology of over 200 patients, and 96% of their patient population uh, were reported to only have uh, a mild case of infections. Um, um, so it, overall, the results appear to be slightly reassuring, and they don't seem to contradict the guidelines that we have made, um, even from the very beginning. Um, and they support that, again, folks who have MS with comorbidity and disabilities combined with older age are exposed to the risk of maybe a worse evolution of the disease. And therefore, we really need to focus on special care in preventing um, certain comorbidities and ensuring um, health and wellness in our patient population. So, you know, overall, I think that we're starting to garner some really helpful um, data and information, but how we extrapolate that to the general MS population in terms of treatment guidelines and consensus, we're still working on that. So the next question is, how safe is it to go on vacation or to stay at a bed and breakfast? And I, when I read this question, a smile came to my face because I thought to myself, uh, part of the answer is, I don't think it's entirely safe ever to go on vacation because of 
of the various things that may come up uh, that are unexpected. I say that a little bit uh, tongue-in-cheek, uh, but there's always been a risk uh, before COVID-19 uh, when we leave home and go on a vacation. Uh, that means the risk of being on the road in our cars, the risk of being on an airplane, uh, the risk of, of the air traffic controllers going on strike and there being a hurricane uh, where we land. Obviously, those risks are now changed in the era of COVID-19, and, and to a large extent, uh, vacations have been very significantly modified. So the, for me, the answer is uh, there is no one answer to how safe is it to go on vacation and stay at a bed and breakfast, but rather all the things that one would take into account. Um, um, am I going into an area that is um, uh, that has a very high level of COVID-19 or an area that is relatively um, uh, on the downswing and less. Uh, how do I get there? Uh, if I've got to go on a crowded plane, uh, aren't my risks greater than if I, at least for COVID-19, than if I went by individual transportation, such as a car? Um, I think cruise ships for the time being are not uh, uh, a, a, an ideal way to, uh, uh, an ideal uh, sort of vehicle of, uh, uh, of transportation or vehicle. Um, and at that point, how sure are you of the place you're going and what do you intend to do there? So I will tell you that my children, by and large, have gone on vacation, not all of them, uh, but they tended to go on vacation uh, in places where they were camping and uh, out in the open and out in the air. I think that, that there are safer ways where there is crowd avoidance. There are more uh, difficult uh, vacations with uh, both with respect to mode of transportation, the place to which you go, and the safety that the place will create for you. That is, do you have confidence that that place will um, uh, keep uh, your room safe, uh, that that place will um, keep you uh, uh, away from other people who may create risk, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a long answer, but my, my answer is uh, there's always been risks about staying home or going on vacation. Those risks are heightened right now, and they depend on vehicle. Uh, they depend on uh, the place to which you'll be going. And the circumstances there, not just the COVID intensity, but how safe the environment is and how much the, uh, you will trust uh, the place in which you're staying. All of those are variables. Uh, I would not say as a blanket that you should not or that you should liberally uh, go on vacation. Just stay smart. Dr. Hurst. Okay, and, and I'll cover the last question and I'll actually cover this uh, pretty quickly so that way we can uh, um, move on to the uh, the Q and A session. Uh, so the last question: As a healthcare worker with MS, is there anything else you should do besides uh, personal protective equipment and what the average person is doing? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, and this is a, a, a somewhat of an annoying uh, answer, but uh, please bear with me. Um, remember that just because one has a diagnosis of MS. It does not mean that one is uh, at increased risk of developing the COVID-19 infection. So it really is on an individualized basis what their overall risk is in the um, workplace, including as a healthcare worker. So um, does this person have any other pre-existing comorbidities? Are they older? Do they have um, physical disability where it's difficult for them to mobilize and therefore might be at an increased risk of having uh, respiratory infections and pneumonia just because they have trouble mobilizing? So it really does depend on what other factors that particular individual has that um, may help stratify the risk of whether or not they might be at an increased risk of COVID-19 susceptibility working in a healthcare system. So I would go ahead and say if someone with MS doesn't have any other risk factors, they're overall young and healthy, and they are being treated with a disease-modifying therapy that doesn't have a significant impact on circulating 
uh, white blood cells and lymphocytes. And I would say they really don't have to do anything beyond what is already being recommended by the CDC and other folks who don't have MS. But if that individual um, is a little bit older, they have um, maybe one or two uncontrolled risk factors, maybe they are on a disease-modifying therapy that uh, reduces circulating white blood cells that may lead to increased susceptibility, that's really a conversation to have with your MS healthcare provider team and human resources to try to develop a plan that um, makes the individual feel safer in the workplace. Great. And uh, Peter, would you like to uh, address the questions which have come in uh, to us? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, that we had several questions they ca that came in, and I'll start reading some off now. Are people with MS more likely to develop a cytokine storm if exposed to COVID-19? I'll, I'll try to answer that. The first, the first answer is, is that we don't know for sure. There has been some um, hopeful uh, uh, comment, at least type, uh, in the uh, opinion, that if you're on a, uh, an anti-inflammatory agent, a, a um, uh, a disease modifying therapy that reduces uh, autoimmunity, reduces inflammation, that, um, that there could be some at least hypothetical advantage in reducing the storm. So it doesn't reduce the likelihood of your getting COVID-19, but it is at least possible that it reduces some of the cytokine storm. And indeed, some of the agents uh, uh, such as interferons uh, have been looked at investigationally to see whether those agents will uh, in some way be beneficial uh, in outcomes of MS. It's all still early and the answers are not yet clear, uh, except to say um, there is no evidence that having MS right now increases the likelihood of a cytokine storm. Treatments could possibly reduce the cytokine storm, but it's not clear. And we're looking at some of the agents that are disease-modifying therapies to see if they may provide some mild benefits. Okay, thank you Peter. for that. Next, next question. Uh, can you speak to what we know about memory loss as an after effect of COVID versus an MS symptom? Dr. Hirsch, do you, would you like to take that one? Yeah, I'm not sure um, I, I completely understand the question, but um, I'll, 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 I'll say this. Um, there are certain um, disease-modifying therapies that are considered B-cell depleters, meaning that the overall mechanism of action of how they help safeguard uh, from future inflammatory events that manifest as relapses and new MRI lesions in the brain and the spinal cord, um, they work at the level of decreasing uh, the subpopulations of some peripherally circulating B cells that can impact some of the memory B cells. Um, but what I would go ahead and mention is that uh, these medications, and I'm referring to uh, rituximab, ocrelizumab, um, and there is a, a, a new uh, a B cell depleter that is about to uh, be launched, um, their overall role is to decrease part of the peripheral B cell population, but they do not decrease or eliminate the entire circulating B cell subpopulation. So one is still able to uh, retain and maintain their um, earliest versions of those B cells that are closer to stem cells and the more mature cells that actually create antibodies. Now, with that being said, we, we previously discussed that there may be, and again, you know, these are hypotheticals based on what we understand about uh, these B cell depleting medicines and how they have um, possibly blunted the effect of other um, vaccines. There may be a blunted response to a future COVID-19 vaccine, but we still don't quite understand to what extent and for how long. So we really are going to require more information 
um, in terms of uh, future trials, specifically looking at patients who are on these disease-modifying therapies after these uh, COVID-19 vaccines um, have already been approved and are available for use. Dr. Hirsch, let me, let me see if I can jump in on this one, too. Uh, I, I, first of all, I, I am very impressed with the sophistication of the immunologic answer you've given. I have a feeling, although I'm not sure, that the question was much more um, basic, and that is, um, if I've got MS, uh, I know that I may have some memory problems. Uh, will COVID-19 increase my cognitive or memory uh, symptomatology? Let me give a, a thought about that, and, and if you want to modify, please feel free to jump in. Uh, clearly, um, a large uh, number of people with uh, MS will complain of some kind of cognitive or memory uh, uh, symptomatology um, even before there was ever COVID-19. We know that, that in the recovery phase, that during the acute infection uh, of uh, COVID-19, people will have um, changes in their memory and, 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 and thinking processes that we will call a delirium. And we know that in the recovery phase from a delirium, there may be some persistent memory changes. It isn't yet well worked out, and I, don't, I haven't seen a, a proper study uh, uh, to uh, tell me about the long-term memory consequences of COVID-19, a problem that, remember, we've only had for seven months, and so there's no one who can tell us uh, what, the, what the change is uh, after a year or two or three. But common sense says to me the following. If you're very sick uh, and have uh, MS, uh, you may be more susceptible to uh, a delirium. Uh, if you're already having memory problems, they may be worse during the acute infection. Uh, infection makes everything, heightens everything uh, with COVID-19, but also with other uh, illnesses that cause fever. My guess is that the recovery phase for people with MS may include more fatigue, uh, and with more fatigue, some more memory symptomatology is still to be worked out. Peter. Great, thank you both for that. Yeah, sure. Uh, next question, can you talk a little about uh, the connection between vitamin D and COVID-19? Dr. Hirsch, uh, that's, I know that's one of your favorite topics and I'd love to hear what you have to say. Sure. Um, I, I, I think that this question has actually come up with, with every uh, webinar that we've had, and um, um, I'm, I'm actually quite impressed with the, uh, the, the quality of the questions that have come, that have come in. Uh, this actually increases my humility as, as well. But, um, yes, there's actually have been a lot of um, hot uh, discussions um, in terms of uh, vitamin D and COVID-19. And, um, you know, from what we understand about vitamin D, we, we, we do understand that there are certain immunological benefits and um, possible neuroprotection in MS if used as an adjunctive treatment to disease-modifying therapies. Um, the overall role of vitamin D in MS still needs to be uh, parsed out completely um, and there are um, uh, clinical trials that are attempting to do that, so we have more definitive information on exactly the role of vitamin D and what benefits we actually do see in MS. Uh, but we do understand that, you know, vitamin D is, is not just a vitamin, it's also a hormone, and it has um, other uh, potential benefits that uh, go outside of, of MS, and, and that includes bone health, that includes cancer health, um, and, and metabolism health as well. And there actually have been um, a variety of, 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 of trials or studies, albeit they have been relatively small, looking at vitamin D and whether or not someone um, has a, a decreased susceptibility risk of getting COVID-19 or if they have a better off time. And, and those studies have actually shown that uh, those patients actually had um, um, a decreased uh, inflammatory responses with COVID-19, and there may, may being the operative word, uh, been some uh, protective measures against COVID-19 susceptibility. And so my overall opinion on this is that, you know, vitamin D supplementation is something that we encourage for 
all of our patients who are living with MS. And certainly this is something that is considered to be safe uh, during COVID-19. And I would certainly encourage the use of vitamin D supplementation uh, within the scope and practice of the uh, primary care doctor or the MS clinician to make sure that vitamin D levels are checked routinely and are being monitored. Peter? Great, thank you for that, sure. Uh, next question, does getting COVID-19 bring on any pseudo exacerbation or make the MS symptoms worse? I'm happy to answer that. Um, the, what I, I kind of have answered that before, but I'll, I'll uh, try to answer it in a more directed way. Anything that causes a fever uh, or an increase in body temperature may cause a worsening of MS symptoms. Uh, it's one of the uh, things that we call a pseudo-relapse. So we know uh, by history that a urinary tract infection or a pneumonia uh, will increase the risk of, uh, 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 I'm sorry, will increase MS symptoms. Uh, if you had numbness in your uh, right leg three years ago due to an attack and it seemed to be fairly quiet, sometimes in the midst of an infection, things will act up and you'll get a reoccurrence of the old symptomatology uh, i.e. a pseudo-relapse. So to the extent that COVID-19 uh, is associated often in its early phase with cough, uh, respiratory symptoms, and fever, you'd expect there to be uh, some increase in symptomatology, uh, at, least, uh, at least due to the fever uh, itself. Uh, my, my experience is that uh, uh, if you've got MS and have some kind of infection, uh, not only are you at more risk of a pseudo relapse, and that is a heightening of symptomatology, but you're just going to feel uh, much more done in than, uh, uh, than, than average. So the answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, there were several questions about vaccines, and I know you discussed them in the presentation part of the program, but uh, one as specific is the Oxford vaccine made with a live virus and just in general, what other vaccines are in development? Carrie, your thoughts? Dr. Hirsch? Yeah, no, so that's a great question. Um, so uh, to date, there have been about 130 uh, trials that have started uh, looking at uh, COVID-19 vaccines, and I believe that there are about somewhere between five and eight that have reached the phase three uh, clinical trial marker. So meaning that this is the last uh, stage of clinical trial testing that is required uh, before that particular drug or vaccine goes to the FDA for approval. Uh, phase three clinical trials um, typically require thousands of patients um, in, in vaccine trials in order to prove their safety and effectiveness. Um, in the case of COVID-19, these phase three clinical trials, uh, one being um, uh, done at Oxford, um, another one um, that is um, uh, being spearheaded uh, here locally with uh, NIH funding uh, through Moderna, um, they are requiring about 30,000 patients uh, to be recruited into these clinical trials to showcase uh, effectiveness and safety. Um, both of these clinical trials are using uh, a, a unique uh, vaccine called an mRNA vaccine. Um, this is a little bit different than your typical um, live attenuated vaccine or killed and activated vaccine where essentially they're taking a uh, a little piece of a genetic marker uh, that codes for the viral uh, capsid protein that is located on the external surface of the COVID-19 uh, virus that um, allows it to um, attach to um, our own um, white blood cells and antibodies in order to create an autoimmune response. So these mRNA vaccines, that's, that's exactly um, how they, the mechanism of action of how uh, a, an autoimmune response, if it is created in an individual, happens, where it is coding for essentially these viral capsid protein markers 
where our own uh, B cells and, and, and antibodies are being able to connect with it and then produce um, a, a, an immune response to it. Um, so it, it's a little exciting because the mechanism is a bit different than what we have previously seen. And, uh, you know, we, we still have yet to see the safety and effectiveness in those um, who are on certain disease-modifying therapies, but um, I'm, I'm hopefully optimistic uh, that we'll be able to see at least some uh, uh, immune response um, among our patients taking uh, certain disease-modifying therapies, but we'll have to wait and see um, with further clinical trials once these vaccines are approved. Dr. Hirsch, I'm going to put you on the spot just a little. Uh, it, we, we've said how humble we are about the fact that we don't know so much, uh, and this is one of those absolute unknowns. Um, neither you nor I know when we're going to be seeing uh, the first uh, usable vaccine. Do you, uh, when you, when you speculate uh, to patients or otherwise, uh, when are you hoping to see uh, the first uh, vaccine available in the U.S.? even if your speculation and optimism prove, in a, uh, prove wrong? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so, so my expectation is that we'll probably have a vaccine available by the end of the year, um, by the end of 2020. Um, of course, uh, you know, with that being said, um, you know, a, a vaccine not only has to uh, uh, be approved, but it also then has to become uh, available to the mass public, um, and it has to be affordable and, and readily available, and then, of course, readily used. Um, so the, the effectiveness of a, a global vaccination program is only going to be as successful uh, as the number of folks who actually uh, take that vaccine, even if it's 100% effective and 100% safe. So that's under ideal conditions. But um, I, I, I'm hopeful that by the end of the year, uh, we will have um, a vaccine approved. That, that's close to mine. I, I, uh, I would have uh, most optimistically ended this year for me. I won't be surprised if we're a little off and uh, see it in the first quarter or the first half of the coming year. But uh, the later it is, the more disappointing because all of us are hoping for something uh, that mitigates uh, uh, this pandemic. And, and then I think, uh, as you pointed out, um, the questions will still remain. Uh, how much of an immune response will it provide uh, in, in, in which people? Uh, the older you are, uh, the less uh, of an immune, or immune response you generally get. The younger you are, the greater the immune response. And so we may have to see uh, uh, variation in our populations. And then the question is, how long will it last? They're hoping, I think, that this uh, will be a vaccine that gets to the core of the virus, which is mutating less, uh, and therefore will be a little bit more enduring but this virus is a very clever one that is mutating, and it doesn't mean we won't be needing um, periodic boosters. Uh, those are my thoughts, but again, those are thoughts about the unknown. So I think, uh, Peter, we, there are a number of questions which we haven't answered. Are there any that, that uh, stood out as a, a last question that you wanted to, uh, uh, to ask? Yes, and, and thank you both again for all those great explanations. There's, there's one last question that kind of does tie into what you just mentioned, and the question is, since there is no vaccine yet, how safe is it to go to regular doctor's appointments, get an MRI, get a mammogram, and go to the dentist? So I'll, I'll try to answer that, and again, if Dr. Hirsch would, would like to add in, I'd be delighted. But... Um, there are things that, that, uh, that change risk. And so uh, some people get to their MRI, for example, in their private car. Some people get to their MRI on uh, public transportation. Uh, some people uh, have uh, uh, infusion centers that are practicing high levels of safety. Uh, some are, are probably a little more, uh, uh, are a little bit at least uh, less clear in terms of their uh, safety precautions. So I think it, there isn't one answer. My, my general answer is um, 
each, uh, whereas I might have been on a autopilot a, a year ago and said, uh, it's a year, it's time for your MRI, uh, or, or uh, it's uh, six months, it's time for your infusion. I at least ask myself the question each time uh, about risk and benefit, generally deciding that the old principles of making sure that we monitor MS, MRIs, making sure that we treat MS, infusions, uh, are still appropriate and my behaviors uh, remain fairly close to what they were before. Dr. Hirsch? No, I absolutely agree with your, your comments. Um, um, you know, gener and generally speaking, um, you know, we, we still have to uh, take care of our patients. We still have to take care of our health. Um, you know, MS is a, a chronic longstanding condition and we still need to monitor. We need to monitor uh, through surveillance MRIs. We need to monitor with labs and we need to monitor by going to see the doctor. So everything is about stratifying that risk benefit ratio. And I, I, my overall uh, concept is, is that if you feel that you can travel safely to see your doctor, to your imaging center and to your lab, that you are able to wear a mask and other healthcare providers are doing the same, maintaining social distancing, then I would say that overall the benefit of surveillance monitoring um, certainly outweighs the potential risks of COVID-19 um, contraction. Thank you. Uh, Peter, any, any final comments? Uh, well, just I want to thank you both so much for your time, your expertise, uh, the presentation, and the excellent responses to the questions that were submitted ahead of time, plus all the ones that came in during the program. So I really do appreciate it. A lot of great information and insights, and I'm sure very much appreciated by our audience as well. Uh, so as I mentioned, this does conclude our webinar tonight, What You Need to Know About COVID-19 and MS Program 6. As you can imagine from the title, we do have five additional COVID-19 and MS webinars, and they are all archived on our website at mymsaa.org. And this webinar will join them as well, uh, probably in a few days, uh, to get that uh, recorded and posted to our website. So please check back. Uh, I would also like to thank our funders, Bristol Myers Squibb, EMD Serono, Genentech, Novartis, and Santa Fe Genzyme for supporting this webinar series. Uh, as mentioned, the program will be archived, so please check back. And I would invite you to take a brief survey that immediately follows this presentation to let us know about thoughts on this program and other webinars you would like to see from MSAA in the future. So on behalf of MSAA, Dr. Hendon, Dr. Hirsch, thank you so much for watching, and please stay safe.